try without the mic. Or if you're if you can't hear just let me know. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Sean Farmer. Uh, I've been doing software for about 20 odd years. And um, in the last kind of eight years, since 2007, 2008, uh, I started doing what is called service oriented architecture. It's an overloaded term, I know, so don't, don't kill me. I feel very protective here, you know, like I, I'm coming to you guys who know all about microservices, and I'm the little fish in the soil pond trying to tell you what to do. So uh, it's not the case, yeah? So the reason I'm here is to kind of, I, I'm, I'm following the, the microservices kind of movement or uh, buzz, buzz that's going on in the last couple of years, and I see that there's a lot, a lot of great stuff coming on, and you know it feels like SOA 2.0 or SOA done better, or put the title yourself. But uh, but I also see that there's a you know something that's repeating in our, in our industry, and that is that we don't learn from the past. You know, we do this 10-year cycle where we invent this new thing and uh, just do the whole thing again, just fail again and try again and fail again and, and it's a shame because the microservices idea is a great idea it's, uh, it's, this is the something that we're looking for for many years that will kind of balance out between the enterprise, the SOA, ESB uh, you know, this is not cool thing and uh, the really cool thing where we can do everything ourselves and we don't need any consultants or high, you know, big license and we could do everything on open source and so on. I hope you get my drift, yeah? So, I, I'm, I really, I'm really here just to try and say, you know, we learned a couple of things and I'd really like to talk about them and hopefully that will give you some insight uh, and will help you in doing uh, uh, microservices pain. Or maybe avoid, you know, avoid some of the pain that we had in our time. The agenda is going to be really light, and 45 minutes is really short. Uh, so I'm, you know, I, I will try not dig into things that are that you can dig out yourself. So things that you can search yourself, or maybe I'll give you resources. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my journey because I think you hopefully you're on the same boat and you've done it all before, and that's why you ended up doing microservices. I'll talk about some concepts of. The things that I think SOA or microservices, the thing will help us, you know, what, what, are, what are the problems it's trying to solve. And I'll go through the lessons learned, maybe a little bit more details about specific things that, um, um, that are, you know, fundamental and I'd really like you to walk away from here and not forget them, okay? So, my journey. So I, I started doing web development in 90 something and uh, back, back then there was no object orientation. Object orientation was for C++ developers, the cool guys, yeah? We were doing ASP pages on, on a single server. Anyone been there before? Yeah, I see one or two, yeah? So we did those apps and it was like single page, then we did it in multiple pages. Then we even introduced VB with, with objects. I don't know if you remember this thing that actually existed. And it was really cool. I mean, it was, but you know, our load, you know, the, the websites we built were like 5,000 users a month. Yeah? That was like, you know, you could get big money from, from uh, advertising on your website if you have 5,000 subscribed users a month. That's enough. You know, you get like good funding and you could go on. Obviously, that changed really quickly, and in the in 90s, we in late 90s, uh, you know, 2000s, we went into um, uh, .NET, and then and the scale in parallel to that also kind of became an issue. Yeah, what what was 5,000 users is now 50,000 users or 100,000 users. The big guys were doing millions of hits a day. You, you heard about all kind of fabulous things and you never understood how, how they work. And, um, you know, so this one page evolved into a, an N tier, uh, if you wish, or multiple tiers. Initially, just a single big monolith with one tier that did everything, yeah, directly from the UI to the database in the web, web app. And then we said, oh, yeah, yeah, this Microsoft says we should do it like this. And we had the 
the M tier uh, best practices. We had like layers that were, you know, had six different responsibilities, and we did that, and that kind of worked pretty well. But still, you know, every time we we kind of hit the envelope of what the, we could scale up to, or if we had a lot of business changes, it failed, and it failed almost consistently. There was no, you know, like we did. We did two years, you know, the first year was all briefing, it's great. You know, we put everything, we are the designers, the executors, the maintainers, it was, you know, a small team. Then the business succeeds, and then we go, oh, whoa, whoa, hold on, now we need to get more people, and we need more teams, and then, you know, more changes to the code. And all of a sudden, this really cool thing that started in the beginning, in the second year was like nightmare. In the third year, it was emergencies, firefighting the whole way, yeah? And then what happens? What do we do? Rewrite. Rewrite, right? We say, hold on, we can't do this anymore. Let's rewrite. And who gets to rewrite? Who does the rewrite? The same guys who did the same, the same guys who did the first one, right? They are now the, 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 the big, you know, the big guns. They've done this before, now they know better, right? And now there's all these new frameworks that we can put in, right? All these obstructions that we can just hide away all the shite in those little places over here and over there, and nobody will see it, and in the code it looks really nice. The only, the only problem is that when you put it into production and it's running, the same problem occurs again and again. Who's been there? I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one. It's about 50% of you. Um, I even did you know the the unthinkable and took my you know we, we took our application that was you know had let's say five business domains and kind of built five different servers and each server each application had a web service on top of it yeah so you could kind of invoke and do request response between those different five uh, applications and it, that seemed like that couldn't break ever Right? Never. That would be perfect. That would be like the killer. We put it out of production, and lo and behold, as soon as one of the guys, one of those applications, had some network outage, the database was like crapping out, the network was, you know, some, something, some network cable went down, or just the web service got unresponsive or something like that, the whole five, the whole system of the five domains just did a domino effect, yeah, just went down one after the other. And of course the worst case is that our customers became the the, um, the denial of, of service attack, yeah? They just came on and they went, what's going on? I can still see the website and I, nothing is going on. You know, then you had to shut down everything and slowly bring up everything and I don't know, anybody tried that kind of thing? <laughs> yeah. It didn't work, right? <laughs> it doesn't. And, and I got really frustrated, you know, at that stage I was doing software for kind of 15, good, the guts of 15 years. I've been through war, you know, horror stories, I've, I've saved the, the universe, yeah, you know, I've been the, that developer that saved the, the, the day. And, but I keep on, you know, I, I kept on feeling that I'm failing. I, you know, I just can't get it right. So I went to my master. And I said, Master, please tell me, what am I doing wrong? That, you know, something must be awfully wrong here. And he said, solve the problem you want. Coupling is your problem. This is the Yoda, well, at least my poor attempt to make a Yoda sentence. So, I went about going, the couple of things, right? What's, what's the problem? We just tear everything apart and everything be cool. Anybody try to kind of bring up a, a legacy system like a system that has enough code and look at the, you know, like a, 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 a dependency graph and figure out where to start? <laughs> it's really, it's a lot of fun, right? It's like, you touch over there and you move, you say, yeah, that class, I'm gonna, you know, you move that link over there, wow, that's great. Now you try to, to do the underlying one and it goes, oh, that's gonna affect five other classes and two others over here and it's gonna, you know, and, and you, you quickly understand that anything you do will, will break the system. There's no way to kind of really, really, really decouple.
couple anything. So I said, there must be more to coupling that, than I understand. So let's park this thing over there and um, just talk about coupling. And the reason I want to dive into coupling is coupling is really the essence of the problem with software architecture. That's at least that's what I think. Um, and we have multiple dimensions to coupling. The most common one is temporal. And that means that anything to do with time. So we do two, two main things on the timeline. One is we request. We go, how long will it take us to get to somewhere? And then we're waiting for the response, right? What happens when we're waiting for that response? What are we doing? Nothing, right? We're waiting for, for this other thing to come back to us, to reply to us. And in the meantime, our thread, our process is kept running. The one who called us is also kept running. The one who called us before is also kept running. And that kind of saturation ends up in, there is a limit to how many requests you can handle in, in one CPU, or eight CPUs, or eight, and so on and so forth. So the synchronous calls, the, the request response, is one of the, the, the hardest kind of things to solve, because once you request something, you have to wait for a response. Can we agree on that? <coughs> Special coupling is uh, more, more uh, kind of deployment related stuff. So who did uh, put the SQL, the SQL connection string in code? No, there must be more than you. Okay, that's more like it. It's something that every no, no, you know, every green developer does, and it sounds really reasonable. And of course, the server is going to be there all the time, and there's no problem. So we just put the, the string in code, and everything works, right? Then it goes to production, and somebody moves the servers from one, one place to another. Anyway, so we we if we we use we use the web config instead or the app config instead, and we use an IP address, right? What's wrong with that? It's, an IP address is like, the, that's what the administrators told us, that's where the server is. And of course that doesn't break, that will break as soon as anybody reconfigures the network or something like that. So we are, at the end of the day, we use naming or CNames or whatever it is to get, or domain names to get to the, to the server, problems more or less solved. The other thing that has to do with, is deployment, yeah? When we deploy something, we think, or we assume that the servers are going to be close to each other. They might be, we might create some kind of uh, dependency that this URI has to be that URI in order for me to call. And then those kind of things are coupling that, that we can't really um, uh, get rid of until, or actually be aware of until we end up in, in production. And the last one is platform. Although it's the least problematic one, probably, uh, it is when you do have platform coupling, it's serious, seriously hard. Yeah. So, if uh, anybody heard of Donna Remoting, it's really old. Yeah. So once upon a time there was object or uh, object uh, object remoting on the .NET platform, it was really cool. You could call from this server to another server. Wow. It, it was really cool because that was the only way to do it. Uh, you know, the concept of messaging was still kind of new and uh, not a lot of people do, did that. So that's a, a, an excellent example of, you know, I can only use my, I can only communicate with other .NET or uh, Microsoft uh, components. The same thing about protocols. Protocols that are very, very uh, specific to your, your platform. And today with having, you know, Linux and Java and, and .NET and Microsoft and all that, all these things have to really talk to each other uh, really well. So a good example of anti-mitigating you know, mitigating platform would be like RESTful uh, services, right? Put up a RESTful API and everybody can talk to it. It's really easy. It's discoverable. It's, it's nice. The other, the other aspect of coupling is this thing that uh, was at least, I think it was 15, 20 years ago, 
when object orientation come around, came around, and if you're doing DDD or any kind of those uh, methodologies, we all try to encapsulate everything, yeah? We go, we have like a, a user that has some orders, and the operation that we do on the orders from the user is encapsulated inside the, the user object, and nobody can actually do it for, for the user. Does that make sense? So encapsulation says that I hide my data, my, my, anything that's mine from the rest of the world. So nobody can actually go into my bits and do any change state, you know, state changes or kind of make, our, uh, make me behave differently than how I think I should behave. Make sense? The problem with that is that when we de decompose business entities, our, the way we build systems is to uh, kind of start at the database, right? How, how do you, you go to the main thing and you say, all right, let's, let's talk about what's going on here. And at least, sorry, maybe, you know, my generation, the, the older way to do it was to go, oh, let's, let's put out the business model, the domain, yeah? So we have a user, we have a cart, we have uh, products, we have orders, shipping, billing, finance, you know, all these tables, right? That are all our entities. And then we go, oh yeah, the user needs to know about orders, our orders need to know about user, and orders need to know pro about products, so we link them, right? We give them, we make this link between those, those entities. Sooner, sooner than later, we end up with a big ball of mud before we even start it, because everything is coupled to everything. If I try to change this entity that does the billing, I need to, to make sure that uh, the other entities around me don't, don't have, have no dependency on the interface I created or the behavior that I do. And the, the, the hard thing about you know, encapsulation and decomposing business entities is to realize that there is, you're going to end up with bits of the user in this component over here because it's responsible to change the user's uh, username and password. And another component will do the address, like in microservices, yeah? So you have like the login component uh, or login microservice. It will do only bit of the data here. And the other, the one that uh, updates the address will do the other bit and so on and so forth. So encapsulation, thinking about encapsulation and autonomy will give you that reducing the size or reducing the width of what you're looking at. The single responsibility principle is the most, to my mind at least, the most uh, kind of forgotten about principle. Yeah? We, how many of you do update user? How many do crude operations? Just, you know, like create, update in your code, yeah? From a business perspective, what does that mean? I want one person to give me an answer. What does it mean when I say update user? Nothing. It's, it's a database operation. If you wanted to source events out of it, if you wanted to say that the business function had happened, you know, something meaningful to the business happened, what do you have to do? You have to go through the method in the update and go figure out which field has changed, right? Or which couple of fields changed, what, what is stale, what is the real, what was the input from the, 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 the user or the UI, and you go and say, oh, actually, it's not really, I'm not really updating the user's address, I'm actually just updating the user's state, right? Does that make sense? If you'd go and say, I am a, you know, my method does this one thing, or my microservices, my, my vertical in microservices creates a user's ID, then the method should be create user ID, right? And the data that re that's responsible for doing that change. Given that it's a single responsibility, it means that I own the data of that change, right? I'm the only one in the system who owns this data, and the only thing that I do is change that thing. If I need to do something else from a business perspective, I need to hand it, to delegate it over 
to the next next uh, component, yeah, to the component that does the next action, or maybe so it's either you know if you're using messaging, it will be like send a message over to the next component, or maybe you publish an event, maybe something else in the system need to really cares about this action. I hope that makes sense. And try not to dig it, you know, to go too too low on this. The kind of what derives from all that is, you know, when you're slicing your vertical stuff, slice it really, really thin. It doesn't mean that it has to be small. It has to be thin in the way that from the top, from the, the, the entry point to the bottom, that is the database, yeah, the end of the change state operation, you're not expanding your scope, you're not expanding your responsibility of the component. Even if, you know, single, talking about the single method, I don't have if, if else, and in the if else I'm going to do two things, and then down the road I'm going to do another if else, I'm going to do four things. And you know, you get a pyramid kind of a, a responsibility diagram, if you wish, where at the top it's really simple, it's really small, and as you go down, it becomes bigger and bigger and has more and more things to do. Does that make sense? Hopefully. So, <clears throat> what's wrong with the monolith? And just, you know, think about the coupling that we talked about. What's wrong with the monolith? The UI, you know, the, the layers work really well because they're, you know, each layer has its own responsibility and inside the layer itself, you'll only see one thing that uh, each each thing is doing, and they're very well kind of you know they're they're very well separated. As you go down, again in the business logic, again you have encapsulation. You have each method is doing its own thing, and then it calls the database layer. The now that might be you know twelve layers, yeah, <laughs> for you know when you have the service layers and the operations layer and all your uh, frameworks and all that. It's like that could be really. But at the end of the day, this vert, you know, the the vertical, the horizontal, is really, really uh, loosely coupled. Looks really clean and nice, right? You open the code and it looks like really little dependencies. Everything is really cool. But when you look at the at the at the vertical um, at the vertical uh, axle, is that right? Access. Access, <laughs> thank you. The vertical axis, you you see that there's a lot of coupling. Now, <coughs> serious coupling. Yeah, we get to a point where everything is, is kind of somehow kind of touching another something else, and they're all kind of very very friendly and very very uh, 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 happy to, to know about each other and to impact each other. Hope that makes sense. So vertical slicing is like taking that concept of what we talked before to say, take this thing that you want to, this operation that you want to do, and slice it vertically, keep it thin, and go all the way down to the database, yeah? I don't know, anybody has microservices with a single database? Yeah? Anyone? No? Saints. So that, that's the first mistake I did with SAW. Yeah? In 2007, I did a nice project. And um, we built a super system. Yeah? It was like built like all vertical things. But they all ended up here. And it worked really well in, in the back. When we started putting it into production, and I have witnesses here, so I, I need to be careful. It didn't really work. Yeah. So everything that kind of makes a lot of sense on the code and looks really, really clean ended up competing on the same resources you know, on, on the database. Yeah. So referential integrity in the database is not going to work at all, right? Anybody does here like insert row to the database and get the ID from the database? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. You know this is. This is how you start the problem. Yeah? This is like, yeah, I have this ID. This is my, my referential integrity. My identifier is from the database. So you 
you're starting with doing request response with the database, yeah? And then everything else has to kind of know of that ID that comes from the database. So you, you can't even, your UI, you're, you're going to talk about the UI a bit, right? <laughs> so the UI is tightly coupled to the FM database at the end of the tunnel, right? There is no way, if, if the database is down, the whole system goes down, right? You're just sitting there like a rubber duck and going, I'm going to wait, I'm going to wait. So, hopefully, that kind of illustrates the, the, um, kind of the, the fundamentals of how, how you can avoid the, the basic pitfalls of, of, uh, of your, your kind of slicing and dicing, decomposing your, your, business, um, your business applications. I'm going to step back a bit to cool the air and talk about the things that we forgot a long time ago because that was in the late 70s, yeah? And um, this guy, uh, Peter Deutsch, kind of put together, uh, he worked for Sun Microsystems and he was really concerned because there were a lot of voices going like, yeah, yeah, we're doing all this <coughs> coding and we're not, we're ignoring all those those problems that we really, really have to kind of focus and, and fix as architects and developers. And I'm not going to dive into those fallacies. Um, I'm going to give you a link and you can download uh, a little book, that uh, ebook that uh, will give you a lot more details about it, okay? But uh, just uh, uh, to give you a taste, uh, anybody thinks, here thinks that the network is reliable? Yeah, well, uh, do I need to bring up all the cases of Amazon and Google and Yahoo and, and no, right? We all had outages, it's big and small, and the network is the one thing that, you know, once you go over the network, you need to, think, you need to kind of really think about what you're doing because the network might be or might not be there. Latency is zero. When you debug, the latency is zero, right? And I, I did it a couple of times in my career where you know it really works really quick, and as soon as you put something to production or even a staging environment, everything becomes to go really slow, and you're not sure why. But there is latency. Sometimes the data center that you use is far away from you, and you're just not realizing that. But latency is a problem. Latency is also relative, right? So latency. For you guys doing web apps uh, where the user will click something, and maybe it will be two milliseconds, maybe it will be you know half a second, maybe a second. Well, it's all right. It's you know it's acceptable. But in some cases, latency is totally unacceptable, right? In some cases, you know, people will invest millions in shaving down a millisecond of over their latency because they're doing stocks or they're doing yeah, doing anybody doing finance here? Yeah, it's hard, right? So latency could be really a big problem. The bandwidth, again, once upon a time, everything was really small. Today, everything is really big and a lot of big stuff, right? Today, even Twitter has video feeds, right? Everybody has large amount, large files, everything streaming. You know, the bandwidth is going to kill you. And at some stage, and obviously, if you're paying for it, it's going to kill you even further. Network is secure. I don't know what you think, but network are the least secure thing. And uh, the nice joke I like about it to say about uh, <coughs> security and network is that computer, when it's shut down in the ground, disconnected from the network, is very secure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there you have to put a cage on top of it so nobody takes it. Yeah, and so it goes on and on. Topology won't change, so you know things do change and. Of course, there's one administrator, and if it gets run by a bus, you're totally screwed. And uh, transport cost is zero, and of course, that in today's world with cloud computing and mobiles and all that, you know it's extremely expensive. And the network is homogeneous. Again, in our world, with all the different platforms that we are integrating with and working with, it's uh, total privacy. I'll give you a, a lab. We will publish those slides, right? Yeah. I presume that we'll publish the slides yes. and you can um, download um, this ebook. It's really nice. I like it. 
it's really cool and it's not not too too heavy, and it gives all the details and solution, uh, you know, the full story and some solutions. There were uh, a couple more fallacies that uh, that I I want to mention. Anybody here heard about Ted Nord? No one. So Ted Nord is one of the I, I liked him. He's he's a really cool guy. He does mostly Java stuff and all that, but he coined another three uh, three uh, fallacies, I guess, that I don't want to dis to quote. I want to make sure I say the right quotes. Uh, the system uh, is uh, should be and is atomic or monolithic. Yeah. So obviously we all I think we all lost that one. Um, the system is finished. Anybody here finished the system? <laughs> or project for that? What, what happened? You were fired? Or maybe the system went down, you know, the company went crashing down? Otherwise, the system is never finished, right? Mm -hmm. So, and the last one is that business logic should, can and should be centralized. And obviously, if you look at coupling, and you look at what happens when you try to centralize anything, or even share anything, yeah? Share between different, different microservices, yeah? If, you, if your team works on, a, on, on one microservice and the other team works on a different microservice, what happens when you try and share the ops assembly? Which version are you talking about? And what happens if somebody in ops decides to change that version, right? Is that a problem or not? Coming back to SRP, if there was only one component that's responsible for something like that, then we won't have a problem, right? But if there's 15 components that try to do this thing, then you do have a problem, right? Make sense? All right. I hope it's the heat and not my talk. <laughs> See, people faint in here. Okay, so. I hope that that can kind of relate to, as, as a saying, yeah, that we're doing microservices or service-oriented architecture to build loosely coupled and highly encapsulated systems, yeah? If we manage to do that, if we manage to decouple our, different, our components that run the system and we manage that every component is encapsulated and it's doing it, this is what it's doing, Anyone heard of bounded context in DDD? So, bounded context is like, you know, if I do that much work, you know, aggregate roots, yeah? No? All these, you know, these terms that say that all this fits in together, yeah? And it doesn't mean that it's the same entity, it doesn't mean it's the same, but they just work together, you know, I need to finish a workflow that does all these things. That's a bounded context, yeah? This is something that you can encapsulate. This is something you can say, it's all tightly coupled. They're good friends. That's all right. You know, if I change anything here, I'll change everything inside that. that. This is encapsulation, yeah? The other important thing about encapsulation is that I'm shielded, logically shielded from the outside world, okay? Nobody can tell me what to do. They can only ask. They still command me. They can only ask. I will not let them do anything that I don't want to do. And I'm the sole responsible, you know, it's my, my sole responsibility to do this technical business capability that I want to do. Anybody disagree with this? Anybody think that we can do better? Uh, I, I'm, I'm stealing this, yeah, that, it's not my ideas. This is Woody's, Woody's stuff, so don't think, I'm, I'm, I'm not taking credit for those, those things. Um, so lessons learned. The one big thing that is, I think, counter to our, I don't know if it's only developers or the human nature, is that it's harder. And I've seen us, us as developers do this thing. We have this resistance to do something that's harder. We love to solve problems, yeah? We really, really love to solve problems. As soon as we solve the problem, we don't want to do anything more with it. And the problem is that in addition to solve the problem, you need to work really hard at it in order to actually solve the system. And that is really, really hard. And basically, 
you know, no, no doubt about it that a monolith is a hundred times easier to build than, a, than it is with a system of microservices. Um, so, if it's hard, do it more often, automate everything, learn from your, you know, learn from your, uh, your mistakes and do it again and again until it works really well. And then it's going to become easier. <coughs> then, it, you know, slowly, slowly, kind of iteratively, you can, uh, you can get better. Yeah, I'm running out of time. So, decompose your business domain is hard and avoid the, the, uh, the, the standard design methodology pitfalls. And that is those things that I mentioned earlier. If you're looking to, at, at, the, at an entity and you're trying to figure out what's happening, don't try and link it to the other entities just because it's, doing, it's acting on this other entity. Just keep those things apart. Look at the business, uh, the business function that you're trying to kind of solve, or the business uh, problem you're trying to solve, and make that happen. <laughs> if you're not using messaging, then uh, I really feel sorry for you because RPC or uh, or or uh, uh, synchronous communication is the is the is what's going to kill you. This is the killer of all things. Yeah. So, if you're using, if you're communicating between two uh, two uh, microservices, anybody does that? Communicating as in I have a RESTful API and I call this other microservice. Yeah. Yeah. That's gonna kill you. It's you know there's no way out of it because at the end of the day, if the other guy doesn't respond, you're dead in the world. So where if you introduce messaging, then there is a hope that you can send a message, that message will come sometime, the other component will, com will consume it when it's ready, whether it's done or up, it's durable, it's, it will give you the, the beginning, it will introduce more problems, but it will give you the, the beginning of how to solve the, the coupling problem. CQS, read about it, command query separation, take away what changes state and do it in one channel and reads, you know, when you want to read data or some view data or anything else, do it on a diff totally different channel, don't mix them up, don't do request response, in, uh, definitely not in, uh, when you're changing state. Data ownership, I don't know what, I don't, I don't have time to go into that, I'm sorry, but Remember what we talked about single responsibility principle. When you're looking at a piece of data, you are the component that owns it, and you should be the only one in the system that owns this piece of data. You're the only one who can change state. It's nothing to do with write, with reads, yeah? You can send copies to the whole world to read your copy of the data, but to write, you should be the only one in the system doing it. Referential integrity in GUIDs, I leave you I leave that alone, but basically, GUIDs are your friends. If you use GUIDs from the UI, then you're, you, you're free to use those GUIDs on your, on, your, um, on your client side, if you wish, and carry them around, and the system, the underlying system, gets a referential integrity, and uh, it is, this is a, a really important bit. I'm, I ran out of time, I think, and I don't want to stop you. At, no, we're still good. We've got about ten more minutes. Okay, we we don't have pizza, so I can hold you on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, as soon as the pizza <laughs> arrives, it's like that's the end. So I'll um, avoid all the mentions of coupling. So when you're thinking of a system and you're building this thing, that's gonna that's dependent on this other thing to answer or to do something, think about it. Because logical coupling is still there, right? If you uh, created a user, and then you're expecting for the user to, to re verify his email, are we, we are not finished, right? Mm -hmm. This is not going to be finished. You send a verification email, but you didn't click the, the, the you know. Can, can you solve this with technology? You can badger, you can send him another email, you could send him an SMS, right? But at the end of the day, until he finishes that process, 
you couple to user. There's some things that you can't solve. <laughs> but obviously, if you're, you know, if you see some kind of coupling that you can't solve, address it, and, and uh, it is extremely, you know, extremely important. No synchronous communication between microservices, and I don't mind sitting all night with anyone who thinks that it's all right, and I will sit and I will argue this until I'm blue in the face. And there's no excuses and nothing whatsoever will, will convince me otherwise, and I'm willing to sit with each and every one of you and explain again and again until we get the point across. It doesn't work, and it's wrong, okay? Sharing data. The common thing that we do is that we take our data, our precious uh, transactional data, and we let a user up in the finance department run a report in the middle of the day. Anybody have, does that happen here and there? This is like the worst thing we, you can allow anyone to do. This is your transactional data, yeah? This is your data. You're operating on it, and somebody comes in, does a gigantic query, locks half your tables, and you're there sitting, you, you're doing the important stuff, he's, he's doing something totally very important for the business, but not from your LTP, not, not from your transaction data. So make sure that you find a mechanism. There, there are a lot of patterns how to do that. It's not nice that the DBAs would hate you, but kind of separate, saying, what I'm working on is, is OLTP. This is my private data. And it is, if you think of microservices that run in multiple app domains or multiple servers even, or multiple networks, they're all in, a, in, in their temporary state, right? Is that correct? This is me running the, you know, I just updated the user's address. But that's just me. What, you know, the business process doesn't end there because I need to verify the email, right? So I need another component to send an email, wait for this email to come back. Still no business, there's still no business value there, right? It's only when the user verifies that I can say, user verify, right? Now I want to write this information into my reporting, my view data, my UI, what goes to the UI to say, hey, this is... This just happened, you know? This is a business, this is the eventual consistency thing that just happened. If you want to read something, go to there, go here. It's gonna have versioning, it's gonna say that it's, you know, this is the right uh, balance of your account as of an hour ago. Oh, that's annoying. I just deposited a thousand euro. Obviously, that didn't go through yet, right? But if I hold the, the, the if I try to compose all those to mesh up all those microservices and bring all the data back up to the UI, and some of it is consistent, some of it is not, what, do, what am I doing? What's the, what's the benefit there? So just think about it, I'm not, you know, this is the rows of beautiful uh, engineering uh, uh, solutions for that. But try, try, try to kind of, where I'm writing is not where I'm reading. And when I'm reading, I'm going to make it available much nicer. I can do a lot of, a lot of tricks and a lot of uh, things to make the UI look a lot better and give a lot better experience to the user. And definitely on reports or business data, that's important. <clears throat> so as I said before, decomposing your business domain, it's the hardest thing that I've, that I've ever experienced. And it's something that you do, you go into a project and you do all the mistakes in the first month, in the second month you, you do better, in the third month you go, oh, now I'm getting this. Six months later you're gonna go, Jesus Christ, what did I do the first month? You know, this is totally wrong, you know, like that. Like, like. So don't, don't name things too quickly. Just go like, this is the yellow service, this does something about finance, this is the thing, yeah, this, or microservice, this thing is doing, you know, the credit card stuff, this is doing uh, the address stuff and so on. But don't be too precious about it. And try to live the domain. And when you know the domain better, then you, you'll find those, uh, you know, how to kind of carve out those things. And, and step away from the database, the tables, the large entities, all those things. Because they have to, your data has to correlate to your microservices, your, what you defined as your responsibility. 
If any, is anyone doing .NET here, by the way? I know that it was a hard question. Yeah, it's like, yeah, 5%. I know, I know, sorry guys. Yeah. <laughs> if you're doing it on .NET, then uh, go, go to a particular platform and, uh, and, and try that. Um, you can do microservices on the .NET, on, on N service bus. That's, forget the, the name, it's a bad name. <laughs> it's not cool anymore. But it's, a, but it's, a, it's an excellent platform. The thing um, that I'm missing here, I might have hidden a slide by mistake. <coughs> Shaky fingers. Um, monitoring. I talked about the rest of the thing. Monitoring is, you know, does anyone really like to drive 120 kilometers an hour in the little roads in Wicklow with no lights on at night? Mm -hmm. Everybody, right? So cool. Like it's so monitoring. You know, in, in regular systems, in monoliths, it's really easy. The whole thing goes down, or it, the whole thing works. You know, it usually does it. There's nothing. To do. <coughs> when you distribute your system and you build microservices and all that, you need to monitor like crazy on everything. And uh, you know. Don't go just by something's working. Look at the business statistics. The, the look at what's happening. What's how's your system living from a business perspective? What it's doing and not doing. If you deploy a new component and all, you know, all of a sudden you get uh, two percent logging to your website. There's something wrong, right? So you need to really, really look at, at what's going on. Um, Deployment, I don't need to tell you that you probably all automate and do the, the continuous delivery and continuous deployment and have DevOps and all that. Automate everything, every little thing. So you can do click and redeploy, click and redeploy. Otherwise, you're going to be in a world of pain going through what's happening here, why is it not, oh, I need to copy this and I copy this and you fail there and then you forget this. And you do. When you have one monolithic system, it either goes or doesn't go. When you have a lot of microservices, then you need to be able to redeploy all of them really quick. You need to fix and, and deploy really quick. It's really, really important. So, but then I'm not. I'm preaching to the believers, I believe. Um, and least but not last but not least is organization. There are two bits in your organization. One is the stakeholders, the business that pay your salaries, and the other ones is your your developers. And they also have to be, you know, right behind you in doing this distributed thing, this, this microservices thing. If they don't believe in it, if the culture is not there, you'll fail. And it doesn't matter how good you are. You could be technically amazing and you could do everything right. And they will just go, no, 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 I want to see the business entity. Yeah? I want to, where, where is my... Where is this thing that, where is the table? Where, where is my database? Where is this thing that shows me that everything's all right, yeah? So you have to sell it and you have to really, really be really good at explaining why you're doing what you're doing and why this is a better solution than the others. I hope uh, that uh, that kind of made sense. If you want, I can answer two questions until the pizza arrives. If not, we can. Uh, um, I actually have a question. Um, so a lot of this is around um, CQRS or CQS and event sort of event sourcing, or basically splitting up your your data into reads and writes. Yeah. Um, I find that works about ninety percent of the time, and then there's, there's a small portion where I need an answer now, and I need an answer based on, on the one question. Have you any recipes, or have you any? any uh, feedback into, into how you can do that because it doesn't it, it, having an answer back straight away doesn't fit with this connected model although yeah. you that you don't need this all the time. Right. So first of all, microservices and service oriented architecture or whatever you want, the, the thing that you're gonna build, there, there's no kind of uh, silver bullet here, yeah? This is not a cookie cutter and if you do everything like that it will work because when you come to certain problems you need different solutions. The question was like, why do we, uh, what do we do 
when we actually need a request response, right? So when we do a request response, then do a request response. No, it's just like take it from the UI directly to your service that does the request response thing, but don't introduce messaging into it. Don't put it into a microservice that you call and then it calls and then you call you get the response like why? Just go directly to that's that's one example, yeah? yeah. You know? Don't not all your not everything has to go through that one line. And when you look at a at a microservice system, you know, where we build a system, you have like hundreds of microservices, and you look at the dimensions and you turn it on different dimensions, then you see actually there is a lot of things hanging off here and here, like integrations. Who does integrations, yeah? So you're doing integrations. Some of them have to go there. You know, you just have to be like really pushy. It's it's not like the potent. You have to be really curious. It's a stop model. Yeah, you have to kind of you know you do one request and then you go no that's that's broken now and you have to do manual. Yeah. yeah. The sound the system you can you, you can go and say oh right hold on I can compensate for that I can do some logic and try again three times or it's a the point says I can hit it like <laughs> endlessly until I get my response or something like that. But but again the point is that you know not everything has to, definitely not everything has to go through messaging or REST APIs or anything like that. You know, you just go and say, all right, I want to actually know the credit card is valid. Why do I go to a microservices that will go and call another point of integration that we do? I can do this directly from the web server, right? I can do it in jQuery or whatever. Right? Yeah, so I have business logic in the UI. So what? Yeah, you know, yeah. like it's it's not a matter of you know like you're not gonna put everything in one box and it's gonna work never you know and it's really important even when you decompose your stuff look at it and always say is this the right way to do it you know it's like always question that maybe this is wrong and if it's fighting you there's a reason for that <laughs> you know if it's like yeah it looks really cool but it actually doesn't work sorry was that, was that a, yeah that's perfect. So um, I'm curious about what a, a, a practical architecture with end service bus would look like. Uh, so if you take a, a really traditional uh, example, like an e-commerce shopping cart, where you have yep. an orders table and a line item table, um, and you have a transaction keeping consistent, what does an asynchronous model look like to solve the same problem? Okay, so. Shopping cart is a, is a great example of synchronous communication. <laughs> Never mind. So in in my shopping cart, I would have a shopping cart. First of all, just from a, you know that aspect of, of the question. In a shopping cart, I would have like a UI component that actually lives in the web. It doesn't live in my backend system at all, and keeps track of my shopping activities. In the same, in parallel to that, I would send messages to my backend that does the shopping cart. Uh, eventual consistency, if you wish, okay? And it would be something like, you know, add, add item to the shopping cart, send it to the component that does the shopping cart persistence, uh, uh, and publish, publish an event or write to a view table, yeah? That says that now I have one, sh one item in my shopping cart. I will cheat forever, yeah? So I will have my shopping cart persistence, my shopping cart state for the UI, in the web, on on the web client or whatever it is, I don't care about it. Yeah, I wouldn't be. But when the user goes to pay, or when the user actually edits its own shopping cart, then I would do the. I would steal. You know, then I'd go to the view model, get the real data. Again, that's request response, right? That's like me going to the view model, getting the data. That's it. Does it make sense or? Yeah. So. At the data level, you're using a document database essentially. The entire shopping cart. I don't. Place. Yes. Yeah, but that's the view model. That's a composite. This is your composite view of the what what is happening in your shopping cart. I think the part that's is missing. That, yeah. I think the part that's missing is that uh, when you're talking about these models, there is the bit in between that you call the and I, I get what you're saying. This is the part where the data actually comes back in. Um, and is read into this, and your, your model gets hydrated, but you're very sure the fact that the messages exist. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the missing part. Um, so basically, the data is going into a, a, it doesn't really matter if it's storage, right? 
Yeah. No, it doesn't matter. Storage technology is just, it doesn't, like, just, just to comment on that, the, whether it's a document database or SQL database or a thing or it's a SQL or not, it doesn't matter. From my perspective, there's no referential integrity, so there's no SQL anyway. Okay? okay so the follow up, I guess the follow up question is where does end service bus fit into that model? So what are the messages so, that go? So end service bus would be like your, your transport. It's like this thing that passes the, the, the messages from one component to another one autonomous component to another autonomous component. It could be closely related or far apart. And so this bus would sit in the... Is, well, is a I'm sorry, but I, I guess it's well, not my a, question is more, what are the specific messages? Is there, is there going to be like a, a read channel or a write channel? Yes. So. Well, and so this bus will not do any reads. That's okay. So to come back to the initial point, that messaging is used only for change staging. Okay? So I'm, I'm going to push a command to say, Change the change state. state. Change the state is done. I'm going to publish an event saying this thing has happened. Other components in the system will do different other other bits of logic. Or maybe in addition to publish an event, or before I publish an event, I might push a command to do the next step. Yeah. So pass on the next step. Or maybe the UI will send me five messages. Yeah. So you're pushing uh, you're pushing data changes. But what if I have another? Uh, what if I want to uh, read the data initially? I'm not making any changes. Do I publish an event that then... No, no, you just go and read the data. I, I, That's the I point. read the data directly from the database? Yes. Okay. So but I don't not use, from my, I don't use not for my for transaction of data. That's the point. That I, I would, you know, once a, day, a state has changed, I'm going to update your view model, your view model, to say that that's the state, right? You're not going into my microservice data. You're going to the view model. You're going to the... Cloud, whatever you want to call it, the radis, the okay. thing that that holds my data and will give you the, the, this information. You don't need me for that. I've I've done my work. I'm finished. Now here is the information. We do something with it. So Ansible's bus, uh, in addition to being a transport, has something that manages state. Yeah, it's called Sagas. And that you know that kind of correlates all those events and it enables you to to do really funky stuff around you know. How do I mash all those events up and decide that the workflow has been finished? If that makes sense. But from a messaging perspective, it should be really, really simple. Okay. And and again, I'll cheat all day. To, to you know, if, I can, if I can save myself some time and go put some stuff in a cookie over there and read from there, I'll do that ten times before I go back to the database. Does it have a total ordering answer? Sorry? It's the messaging totally ordered, basically. No. It's not. Okay. No. I, I don't know, it's the hardest thing about messaging is to, mm -hmm. that orders, that message ordering is never, you, nobody can really promise message ordering. You can cheat, you can, you know, kind of take all the messages, sort them by the day time that they were sent, originated, you know, and then maybe you can kind of make sense of it. And that's where the sagas come along, yeah? So the sagas are, are able, you know, you're able to go and say, oh, I got this message, I got this message, I got this message, oh, now I'm complete, I have all these. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you'll know you've missed a message. Yeah, so I'm waiting, I basically, I can, I can time out myself, there's the concept of timeouts to go, oh, I didn't uh, get the, the third message, I'm timeout for another 10 seconds. You know, the, the timeout message comes along, I check again, didn't come out, and so on and so on. This is a state machine, yeah? It's like, it enables you to manage the, the, the asynchronous process. But, but if I got message one and message three, I'll know I've missed me and I didn't get two, I'll know I've missed it when I yes, received three because and I got wait for wrote, it. Yeah, you write so it I can't into your state. Three till I've got two basically. Yeah. Okay. So you write it into your state. You go, Oh, I got message one, <clears throat> write it to the to my table. Got message two, write it to my table. Now I'm waiting for message three. Or message one. Or does that make sense? Yeah. Sorry, uh, Sean, I just was wondering about about vertical slicing when you were saying the database. Mm -hmm. So what you mean? You should not have one database. You like have a lot of tables, or what? Different databases. It's more a logical thing. You know, technical thing. You can you can take one database, put it in, a, you know, put everything in one database, right? The important thing is that the tables are going to be aligned to your microservice, yeah, to your component even, not the microservice. So imagine that you have two methods, okay? Imagine that you have the, the vicious, no, not the vicious, not the, forget it. Let's say you have like a create product, okay, and update product. Now, 
these are not the names, but let's say that these are the names, just to make, keep it simple. And both of them are looking at the same fields, right? Okay? And I get now 20,000 requests to create products, and at the same time, you know, as I get it, I get 20 more thousand requests to update the product. What happens there? What would we have? What's going to happen? You won't be together. Like, I'm, I'm going to get like tons, tons, tons of deadlocks, right? Yes. I'm going to have one, one row trying to write. You know, we're going to try and write a, a row, and we'll try and update the row at the same time, right? It's a problem, right? So try, now it's a bad example because insert and update should not really be, you know, there should be separate operations, and logically that shouldn't happen. But I'm trying to say, like, if, if you're updating two fields and another two fields, and they're both in the same row, the two different components are trying to access that row, then you're going to be with a deadlock, right? Does that make sense? So I'm saying take these two fields over there, put them in one component, two fields over there in the other component. Obviously both of them hold the referential integrity, that's the GUI that comes along with the bounded context, yeah? Your first message or Pizza is come. <laughs> I get my break. <laughs> Thank you very much.